Hello and ha- well, happy Friday, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volt, founder of the Volt Firm and chief product officer at Open Vault. Today, we're focusing on the intricacies of Doxis 3.1 with a show on your questions and our answers. And now, let me introduce our co host, a man who knows so much about Doxis, he remembers when the D in Doxis stood for dinosaur. The one and the only John Downey, CMTS technical expert. John, how are you doing today? And are you still fighting off those velocipus? Yeah, those other dinosaurs. (laughs) Hey, uh, I'm not doing bad, Bill Belichick. (laughs) I like the sweatshirt. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. It's a a company shirt. This is your, you know. One drop at a time. Yeah, one, <laughs> drop, at time, one drop at a time. Sure. Liquor. One drop at a time. <laughs> okay, through the day. <laughs> every, I dropped every house. Hey, things are going good. Um, it's been a little while since we did our last episode, right? It has. It was, it's been a year. <laughs> I right into that one. That was bad. <laughs> that was bad. I've been since twenty twenty three. We should set up the next one for the last Thursday of the year because it's the only day in four years it's leap year this year so yeah. we should be playing ice next month <laughs> i didn't realize it was a leap year again boy that, that snuck yeah, up quickly like, yeah. it seems like it's been yeah. four years since the last leap year <laughs> <laughs> so uh so uh john we have questions from our viewers and i encourage everyone please drop ch- uh, your any questions you have into the chat and any any other questions you have Please uh, drop down, you know, into if you're not watching live, drop them into our comments section because your questions do wind up in our show. We've got five questions for today's show. Um, the first question comes from Dakota W. He says, in a Doxis 3.1 environment, what are the key differences between OFDM and SC QAM channels in terms of performance and deployments? How do these differences impact network planning so we got we got sc qualm and ofdm channels um so there's i mean there's lots of differences and, and lots of different things we take into consideration when we're looking at um you know, where we place sc qualms how we use ofdm channels uh i know i have some thoughts john what are what are your thoughts off the top of your head well, i mean and we've gone over some of this stuff before when we were going into docs 3.1 and let's just assume we're talking about downstream right ofdm downstream single carrier qualm uh downstream uh, in the U.S., we use uh, Annex B, six megahertz wide single carrier qualms. Um, that was, you know, primarily for Doxus 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, Doxus 3.0. We go to Doxus 3.1. We're talking new hardware, new cable modems, but we're also talking about a big block of spectrum with subcarriers. That block of spectrum could be 192 megahertz wide, with 8,000 subcarriers inside of it every 25 kilohertz if you wanted to. Um, it doesn't have to be 192 megahertz wide, which is the equivalent of 32 six megahertz single carrier qualms. Um, you know, if you look at the bigger the pipe, the more speed, because technically it's less overhead when it's a bigger pipe, higher modulation, more channels or a bigger channel, if you will, uh, there's less overhead than say a smaller channel. Um, so it, bigger is better in this regard. Uh, spectrum allocation is a huge one. I used to go through spectrum allocation all the time. Where am I going to put this block? You know, where do I have spectrum available? Am I worried about high pass filters out in the field, low pass filters? What's the lowest the three one modem can even scan on? Like inside the modem, the vendor of the modem might put a scanning table and say, "Hey, start scanning for your downstream frequency to lock on at four fifty three megahertz and above," or it might say, "Let's start at that what the spec says for Doxus." 2.0 and 3.0 and 1.0, let's start all the way down to, you know, 88 megahertz or 55 or wherever they're starting. Um, but in Doxus 3.1, a lot of people might not know this, the must not, the must is scan from 258 and above. Right. It's a may start scanning below. So I've had plenty of problems where someone set up Doxus 3.1 channel below 258, made that block channel a primary channel so the modem had to lock on a primary channel and it couldn't find it because the modem itself wouldn't scan that low now if they made a single carrier qualm cross bonded with the ofdm and the single carrier qualm was primary above 258 it would lock on 
And then it would bond with the OFDM. That was a secondary channel, but not a primary. So yeah, there are some nuances there about spectrum allocation, where I put it, do I have roll off? What are my levels? Uh, where is it? Where am I going to get the most success? You know, because ultimately we're trying to do OFDM to get more speed, not just more robustness or throw it into spectrum that we couldn't use for single carrier qualm. We're activating that big block so we can get more speed. That's my my feelings. Well, I think you made a, a couple of good points here. I mean, we you know we tend to think well in in all of our networks we're going to put our DOCSIS channel up above 500 megahertz, and typically yeah. that's what we do which makes it easy for the modems to to recognize those channels and to easily lock onto those channels. But the reality is we have networks that have old equipment um, in them, you know, some markets that have old equipment, and that really forces us, to, forces us to be creative about where we put our channels. And to your point, we've definitely seen markets, areas of network where we're pushing those DOCSIS channels uh, in new frontiers, areas where we generally wouldn't put them. I've even seen areas where we were forced to put DOCSIS channels in the FM band, 88 to 108 megahertz, because that's we had to do what we had to do in order to, to make the network um, function properly. But to your point, um, some modems are not going to recognize those frequency bands, uh, and that can cause a lot of strange things. So I've, I've seen you know folks say that you know, my modem's not locking. It's not coming online and connecting to the network or a particular brand of modem is not seeing those DOCSIS channels where other modems are, or maybe it's taking 45 minutes or an hour for a modem to come online and register. So each one of these, I think, can help operators understand if, if you put your DOCSIS channels in areas of the spectrum where typically they're not supposed to, well, you know, we don't typically put those DOCSIS channels. That can cause issues for the modems to register or take a, a much longer time to register. So uh, all good points you made, John. Some some things that I had thought about um, and saw some questions coming. We'll get to those in just a second. But um, so the allocation of modems, when we think about SCQAM and the OFDM channel in the downstream, you know, our DOCSIS 2.0 modems, our DOCSIS 3.0 modems can't take advantage of the OFDM channel at all. So they're going to utilize all the capacity that's on the SC qualms. Our DOCSIS 3.1 modems, they can use the capacity on the SC qualms and the OFDM channel, assuming that they're actually locking to the OFDM channel. Why would a 3.1 modem not be able to lock to the OFDM channel? Maybe because we put the OFDM channel in a portion of our network that's in a roll-off, that you know it's kind of rolling off and now it's it's impaired. The OFDM channel has impairments in it. So now the DOCSIS 3.1 modem can't lock to the OFDM channel and utilize that traffic. So our DOCSIS 3.1 modems are now utilizing capacity on the SC qualms. And now 3.1 modems are competing for SC qualm capacity, taking that capacity away from our DOCSIS 3.0 and maybe some legacy DOCSIS 2.0 modems on the network. And what we're doing with our DOCSIS 3.1 is we want to you know, really give high capacity speed to our DOCSIS 3.1 users. Maybe we're doing 500 megabits per second or a gig on the downstream, and now we're starting to scratch our head. Well, you know, why is it our DOCSIS 3.1 users aren't getting that capacity we're giving to them? That was because they're not yeah. locking to the OFDM channel, and they're not like getting that speed. It exacerbates the problem. You're giving someone a 3.1 modem to get higher speeds. It's imperative that they do exactly what you wanted them to do, and if they don't lock on to 3.1 because of problems, now they're relegated to the single area qualm with the higher speed qua setting, and now they're going to chew up and eat the, all the capacity for your legacy. Yes, for your 3.0 modems. Words that have been very loyal all these years, <laughs> and now they're getting starved out. So yeah, it's uh, I and I think I told you this before. It I think it would have been a good maybe a patent pending idea that any modem that didn't lock on to its capability and what's available and was in a lower state that it should get also a different cost file. Yep. Like never be able to have a quality service or a max rate more than 50% of what its capacity is at that point. Totally great. And yeah. That would be a nice feature. Works, right? It downloads the CM file and CM file says, hey, you get one gigabit per second. Oh, yeah, but I'm locked on 32 single carrier qualm, which is only one gig total. So he could be one guy could be starving out everybody else yeah. for, you know, brief times and stuff like that. Um, the, the beauty of the 3.1 modem is the 3.1 modem that is locked on the OFDM properly. It'll utilize that spectrum before it bleeds over to the single carrier qualm. 
Correct. You hope. Yes. You hope. So, uh, hi to Rick in the chat room, and then Hank Jan Meyer says, how big is an OFDMA code word? Is it the same as an OFDM code word, 16 kilobyte? Does the time and frequency interle- interleaving work the same as with OFDM? This is a stump the chump. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I mean, so OFDM co- OFDMA code words vary in size depending on how much data is being sent up in the upstream. We like meet small, medium, large code words in the upside. So so I think in the for OFDMA code words, no, they're not going to be the same as OFDM code words. And then the second part of the question is that does the interleaving work the same? So I, the interleaving is is not the same as in OFDM um, for uh, for OFDMA. The interleaving is done differently. Um, but that I am, John. Are you up to speed with interleaving in no, OFDMA? Really. Because yeah, I've not. not really. I'm way more familiar with SC Quam interleaving, but I have not dug into OFDMA interleaving. Yeah, I uh, I haven't gotten that deep into the OFDMA code word sizes and stuff like that. Jason Miller would have been a good guy. And now yep. that we're both kind of retired from Cisco, he might never answer the phone again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Hank, I, you know, I'm really glad you asked the question about interleaving. In in the next article of Broadband Library, I just I, I did an article on um, estimating the capacity, and, and actually I did a Python script based on Karthik Sunderson's article that he had done a couple years ago, where he did some pseudocode for um, uh, actually the, the actual capacity calculation for the downstream OFDM. So I, I in that article, you also find a link where I expanded on Karthik's. I, I did the whole thing for um, a very accurate Python estimation for uh, calculating OFDM capacity. But now you've got me. That, so that now I, what I want to do is um, as I, I'm going to do the same thing for the upstream capacity estimation, and I need to dig into the interleaving for OFDMA. So I will be able to uh, follow, do a follow-up, Hank, to answer that question specifically on interleaving for OFDMA, because I have to dig into that next. Um, so I apologize, I don't have the answer yet. Uh, follow. So you ask another question, Hank, making the OFDMA channel wider, 96 megahertz, will be less susceptible for code word errors. I, that's, that's a question you're an- asking. Um, so I think that that's probably going to tie into the interleaving, right, John? So if, if we have a small OFDMA channel um, versus a wide OFDMA channel, I think Hank's question is, is a wide OFDMA channel less susceptible to, in, to errors than a narrow OFDMA channel? My initial thought on that is no, because the, the way the OFDMA works in the, in the upstream is we have the concept of mini slots, each mini slot being 400 kilohertz wide. So if we make, you know, if that OFDMA channel is 10 megahertz wide or 96 megahertz wide, you're just adding more mini slots. And when a cable modem transmits its data in the upstream, it's transmitting within that 400 kilohertz wide mini slot. The interleaving, the error correction, everything's done in that 400 kilohertz wide mini slot. Doesn't matter how wide the channel is. That would be my take on it, John. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree because you might say, hey, I only need one mini slot of information because I'm such a high modulation, 400 kilohertz might be enough for me to, to send an acknowledgement or from a downstream TCP, I just send an upstream MAC. Well, yeah. maybe that's all I'm sending on the upstream. So it's one mini slot, 400 kilohertz could be eight or six subcarriers, but that interleaving is within that mini slot. Um, so yeah, I, I've never really gotten that too in depth with the upstream interleaving. I knew how the single carrier qualm was working in regards to uh, <laughs> allowing me to interleave some of the data for impulse noise issues. Right. Um, and you and I did some lab work on that as well, yeah. turning it off and turning it on. And yeah. um, so, Hank, you stumped us on one. I think we got the other one correct. I have to do some more research for OFDMA interleaving, which that's been on my back burner to do anyhow. So, great questions, Hank. Thank you for those. Um, so, folks, we really appreciate if you hit the likes button, if you enjoy the content, and click on that subscribe and the notification bell to get notified when upcoming live streams get released one more uh comment on the uh, spectrum allocation uh, keep it simple stupid kiss yeah. principle the way i like it uh but i know it is what it is you have to put it where spectrum is available but if every if you could keep all your docs and stuff contiguous side by side it just makes it easier for everybody yes. even the rf pets out in the field it makes you know, troubleshooting you, a lot easier I, I think one problem with doing single carrier qualm at the high end and still having someone at the low end 
what if you had DOCSIS 2 load balancing where a modem moved from 200 megahertz and had to jump to a single carrier qualm at 700 megahertz? That's... The level of disparity at the end of line is so different, the modem might drop offline. <laughs> it might come back online, but that level is so different, it's going to drop offline and come back. I was going to say, that so, creates the perfect deregistration condition for the modem. So think yeah. of the subscriber that's going to experience it. If they're on the phone over that modem, that call's going to drop. If they're gaming, it's going to be, uh, you know, that they're going to they're going to get shot in that game. They're, <laughs> they're going to die. About, yeah. The nice thing about the phone calls, at least where Cisco was, if there was a phone call happening, we wouldn't allow that modem right. to move. Yeah, the game. Well, if it's a Zoom call, you're not going to know that they're on a Zoom call. Oh yeah, call. yeah, yeah. Of course, <laughs> it's not a, an actual VoIP call, right? Yes, it's just, you're doing VoIP voice over your computer, so it's just data. Right. They can't tell the difference. It's encrypted. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's move on to our next question, John. This question comes from Jamie M. He says, "Can you explain the impact of upstream channel bonding in Doxis 3.1?" How does increasing the number of upstream channels affect network performance and capacity? And, and I think we should include not just SE qualms, but OFDMA in the upstream here, because that really throws in a, a, a new twist to this, as, as we've been talking so far. Yeah, we talk about spectrum allocation of the downstream. Upstream is even worse, right? Because there's not much spectrum. Right. So trying to find a little bit of spectrum for OFDMA, DOCSIS 3.1, where those modems are the only ones that can use it, that's a tough sell, a hard total swallow, I guess you could say. Um, but if I can go to 85 megahertz mid split or 204 megahertz upstream high split, I have more spectrum to work with. And above 85, the older modems can't use it anyway. So that's a no brainer. But then I run into house amps that have low pass, high pass filters. So they don't work in those houses with a downstream house amp, but the upstream is only 42 megahertz. So right. that's a problem for 3.1. Um, so understanding if I can get the spectrum and I allocate it, fine. The upstream is request grant. It's not just like downstream where the 3 one modem can say, hey, I want to use up all my downstream OFDM before I bleed over to the single carrier qualm. On the upstream, it really comes down to how much speed you're trying to do and how much your max transmit burst is in the, C in the CM file. Um, so you could have a 3 one modem says, hey, I want 500 megabits per second. It might end up doing 300 with the OFDMA and still eat up 200 meg on the single carrier qualm. Right. Which there might not even be 200 meg in the single carrier qualm. Because four ATDMA channels is only worth 108. You know, so- It's roughly 27. At, if each single carrier qualm is operating at 64, qualm. each single carrier qualm is operating at a modulation of 64 qualm, then each channel ha it's can- tra qualm. Yeah, six, At 6.4 megahertz wide, then each channel can support roughly 27 megabits per second. And then as you bond each channel together, so this is a channel bonding, yep. you, you take basically 27 megabits per second from the first channel, you bond the second channel, that's gonna be 27 times two. So now, now you're you're getting up to you know roughly 50 megabits, six, close to 60 megabits per second. Yeah. And you add the third one, now you're taking 27 megabits per second times three. So you're, you're basically creating a fatter pipe by bonding yep. these SC qualms. Yep. When you bring in the OFDMA channel, that OFDMA channel is gonna have a lot more capacity, but it's only going to be usable by DOCSIS 3.1 modems. So it's kind of like the downstream when we were talking about that, that only the DOCSIS 3.0 modems can use that large pipe for the SC qualms, but the DOCSIS 3.1 modems can use the SC qualms, the large pipe that we've bonded together for the SC qualms, but it can also use the capacity for the OFDMA channel. Again, assuming the OFDMA channel is configured properly and the DOCSIS 3.1 modems can lock to that OFDMA yeah. channel. So the, the argument would be at what penetration or percentage of penetration makes sense to give more three one spectrum the spectrum is a hot commodity yeah so if i and i used to argue i think 10 percent of your customer base has a three one modem they're the ones that want more speed they probably already have more downstream speed they need so pushing them to a three one modem and the three one spectrum is enough to offload them from the single carrier qualm and then they're 90 percent left over the two one modem the three one modems are still okay with maybe even one less single carrier qualm. So there's got to there's a there's got to be an inflection point where you're like Rob Peter to pay Paul. Right. How do I take the spectrum and say, all right, OFDM, single carrier qualm. At what point does the OFDM start eating into the single carrier qualm where it makes sense? 
Now, I need the single carrier qualm for maybe VoIP because I know at the time when I was at Cisco, we still required a single carrier qualm to provide jitter and latency requirements for VoIP. We couldn't do it to over the OFDMA at the time. So I don't even know that's been activated yet. So I still need a single carrier qualm even for a 3 1 VoIP modem. I need single carrier qualm for DSG, DOCSIS set setup gateways, if they're out there. I need them for DOCSIS 2 modems, and I need them for DOCSIS 3 modems. Yes. So set top box, voice, legacy modems, I still need single carrier qualms. Yeah, and so there's still a lot of power supplies and other old equipment out there that still have DOCSIS 2 modems in them for monitoring. That that we're still going to be, we're, for some time, we're going to have that single carrier qualm up there. So the question is, how many do I need? Um, I don't want to get down to zero, even if I had all three one modems, because I still need that one for me VoIP. So my other argument is, it's better to have bonding of OFDMA with one or two single carrier qualm because it's almost like you're creating redundancy. You know how downstream is a primary downstream? Yes. If you lose a primary, it's all You're fine. done. <laughs> when they upstream, they're all primary right. because we do station maintenance on every one of them. So if we lose any one of those frequencies, it'll still stay up and running and just go into partial mode. So that's kind of a nice thing. The problem with too many upstream channels is every upstream channel is creating 500 maps on the downstream. Uh, and each map could be about a hundred bytes or so. So I do the math, um, the more upstreams in a Mac domain, a cable interface, uh, the more downstream overhead I have on every primary downstream in that Mac domain. Right. So I could be eating up one, two megabits per second on the downstream to support all those upstreams of maps, which is, you know, the information I have to send on the downstream, to let the modems know when they can send on the upstream. We're wasting data. <laughs> yes, it's I mean, lost capacity. Five, 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 two meg from a thirty-seven meg downstream pipe, and I have a lot of them, but it it, it can add up, right? Yeah. So I mean, the the next best thing is to go to two hundred four megahertz. Which uh, we, we have a comment from Jeremiah that says, "What is the maximum modem transmit for OFDMA with fully loaded two hundred four megahertz upstream? Any advice on where to to use which modulations? Avoid FM." or cap at qualm 64. So there's multiple questions here, uh, Jeremiah. Nice uh, compound question you gave us, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think the first part is what is the max modem transmit? So maximum modem transmit power, right? Which we know is 65 dBmV, but that's kind of like a loaded question. Yeah, that's for 1.6. I might have to do the math here. Yeah. So if you take the biggest OFDMA, and you say it's 96 megahertz wide, that's the biggest you can do, and you cut that into 1.6 slices, you end up with, um, what is it? Do the math. Who's got yeah, the calculator? I don't have a calculator with me, but... Uh, 96 divided by 1.6 is 60. 10 times log of 60, <laughs> or uh, what is that? You don't have a scientific calculator there? <laughs> it's it's going to be, so you, you've got to do a correction factor, and yeah, I do have a scientific calculator. Everyone does, right? Uh, 60 and then log is 1.7 uh, times 10 is 17.78. So let's say 18. So if you take 65 minus 18, what do you get? 65, 55, 43, 47. It's going to be 47. So 47 dBmV is the max transmit for the 1.6 because if you add them all up, it's going to equal 65 max, mm -hmm. right? That's how we, we did the math backwards. But that 47 for 1.6, if we equate that to a power of a single carrier qualm, we're going to add 60 B to that. So it's uh, 53. 53. So 53 dBmV, which is pretty dang good because if you did single carrier qualm, the max for four channel bonding, according to the spec, is 51. Yes. No, no, yeah. So DOCSIS, without question, DOCSIS 3.1 modems have a higher overall transmit power than DOCSIS 3.0 modems or even DOCSIS 2.0 modems before that. Uh, I think where the complexity arises, and, and um, there was a great SCTE Expo paper done at this past SCTE. Uh, you can find it on nctatechnicalpapers.com, and it focused on understanding how to calculate the max transmit power of DOCSIS 3.1 modems because it does get a little bit complex when you're dealing with uh, combining the SC qualms and the OFDMA, and particularly if you have multiple OFDMA channels. Um, to, as John was doing the math right here, figuring out how 
how you compute the max transmit power with respect to a 1.6 megahertz car um, carrier, that's covered in the NCA technical papers. I'll try to remember to put a link uh, to in the in the show notes and and also link it. Uh, and and to complicate that matter is it's the max transmit for everything coming out of the modem. Yes. Because the modem cross bonding single carrier Correct. qualm with single PMA, you have to add it all up. Exactly. So yeah. So, so that that was the first part to Jeremiah's. Uh, so then he say, he says with a fully loaded two hundred four megahertz upstream, any on advice where to use which modulations, um, and and, and you know should we avoid easy. FM bands and stuff like that? So I I mean I think the higher in frequency generally you can use higher order modulations because you're going to have less noise. If you're putting it down say five to twenty megahertz, um, that's a a lot of noise in that area, so you're probably going to want to use lower modulations in but your OFDMA the, profiles. The PNM, the 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 what we call PMA, PSM, PMA profile management PMA application will let the modem know he has poor performance at lower frequency and tell that modem, hey, you're okay to transmit QPSK at that frequency. Yeah. but it's not going to relegate that modulation to everybody. So I don't want to set it low for everybody unless I know the entire spectrum is really bad. Because it is noise funneling, right? Correct. And so if the noise is funneling, everyone's going to see that crappy low. But the PMA can tell each modem, hey, you're okay to work or you're not okay to work at this modulation at these frequencies. Correct. Yeah. PMA can adjust not just the default flat profile uh, within the OFDMA channel, but it could it could identify a noise impairment at a specific frequency and create a notch within that profile uh, to drop the modulation. So say your flat profile was you know uh, 1024 qualm, but where that noise is, it could drop your profile to um, 16 qualm if it had to go that low where that noise impairment is, and then the rest of your profile could jump back up to 1024 qualm. So P the PMA engine has quite a, a, a profound capability to work around noise impairments while keeping the capability of your OFDM or OFDMA channel um, to to transport data across it as, as high as possible. And it works around those noise areas. So thanks for, Frank, thanks for your question, Jeremiah. I, I do think, you know, operators are, if they're not using a PMA type application, they are creating um, what are called exclusion bands, where they just turn off the OFDM subcarriers around areas like the FM band, because yes, we know we're going to have a lot of noise around the FM band. There's also another area, um, the IF uh, output of a TV, I think that's 74 megahertz. That is also a known area where we can see a lot of noise. So we will exclude those subcarriers as well. Um, but a recommendation is to use um, a PMA application um, that will that can really see those impairments looking at RxMER data from the modems themselves and then compensate, you know, adjust the individual subcarriers themselves to compensate those impairments so the modem can maximize uh, the upstream. Uh, so great. That was uh, that was Jamie's question. We're making good time here, John. Let's move. Yeah, I've, even seen, I've even seen where if people know the 3-1 modems have a little bit more power and they're not doing 204, so they have some power left for the spectrum they're using, I've seen them change the CMTS to say, let's hit the CMTS at plus three. Right. And keep the same pair of qualm at zero. That way the OFDM A comes out three dB higher from the modem and can maybe run a bigger, a higher modulation scheme. Yeah, and we'll talk about that on our last question about uh, CMTS with really high inputs to it. Um, next question is, uh, how does DOCSIS 3.1 impact customers who refuse to upgrade their equipment. This comes from Patel. And Patel asks about the impact of DOCSIS 301 on customers who stick with older DOCSIS 2.0 equipment. Uh, this reflects concerns about compatibility and the necess necessity of hardware upgrades for users to enjoy the advantages of newer DOCSIS 3.1 standard. I mean, I think it's really the, um, the MSO cable sub cable providers job to not allow them to sign up for a speed that's not capable of the modem in the first place or even more than 50% of the modem's capability. So if they don't want to upgrade, you're like, fine, you can stick with that to a modem, but I'll never sell you more than uh, maybe 20 meg down. Yeah. If you want more than 20 meg down, you've got to upgrade to at least a 3 -0 modem. Because if they're going to uh, let them use up an entire single carrier qualm, 
that's going to make your load balancing way too aggressive. It's going to, and if that modem had to move, it would just overload the next channel and move to. So I think that's the that's the crux of the issue of why we want subscribers to upgrade from a Doxus 2.0 modem to a 3.0 or 3.1 modem. If if they have one of these older Doxus 2.0 modems and they're using data, that Doxus 2.0 modem is going to lock to a single downstream SC QAM and a single upstream SC QAM channel, and and that's what it's going to stay on that channel, and then. If that subscriber consumes a lot of downstream or a lot of upstream data, it's going to use all the it's going to use a lot of capacity on that SC QAM channel in the downstream and in the upstream. So that's that, that's one problem with a, an, a legacy or older Doxus 2.0 modem. Um, is it's just too much. Like to your point, it's going to use too much capacity. It's going to imbalance your SC QAM channels. I think another problem is these certificates on Doxus 2.0 modems had expired. So Depending on the operator, you know, you may be able to deal with that. And these are the BPI, our baseline privacy infrastructure the interface. I think that's what BPI is, right? <laughs> BPI. <laughs> so BPI is how we encrypt data on the RF network between the cable modem and the CMTS. So a lot of these older modems have certificates that expired. And um, the really old ones, we just can't upgrade to certs. So we... Maybe have to you know do some things in the CMTS that breaks down the security there, so we can get rid of those old modems and, and upgrade them ideally. Um, that same thing applies to do- some older Doxus 3.0 modems. Um, Jeremiah says, "Is there a such thing as too many IUCs? Does efficiency drop with too many modulations available?" Um, so in the in the so. John, we talked about that, I think, a couple episodes ago with having too low of an IUC uh, on like a Doxus, an OFDM A or an OFDM channel. We want to, we, we don't want the modulation lo- levels to be too low. IUCs is a term used for OFDM A, upstream. Yep. Uh, downstream, we don't, I don't think we even use that term IUC, no. right? Uh, downstream is just different modulation profiles. On the downstream, I used to say the modem might have a, I call it an NVRAM, whether it's a, a memory storage in the modem or at all. It would only store so many downstream profiles. And if you created too many profiles and it didn't store it, it'd have to go to the CMTS and get a, something called a DBC, dynamic bonding change. And you could lose some layer three traffic trying to get that new profile. So I used to say, you know what? Keep it simple. If the modem has the capability to store five, just do five. Right. Do a 4K QAM, a 2K QAM, a 1K QAM, a 512, and maybe a mixed and be done with it. Now, when you start doing PMA, you make it more complex. Yes. Now, it says, I can store these five, but you know what? I might need a special one just for me, and I'm just going to suffer maybe four or five seconds of layer three connectivity loss to get that new profile from the PMA app. But on the upstream, you have IUCs, interval usage codes. Really, that's the same terminology, upstream modulation profiles, the IUCs. Correct. And we only have so many, right? We can use for 3.1 modem, we can use 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, and 12, 13. 13. Right? 13 is the registration. 13 is the yeah. IUC that the modem the uses to register. will be the lowest modulation because right. that's what the modem is going to use to lock on. And then the CMTS and cable modem are going to negotiate a better one that you created. And Correct. IUC number five might be uh, 1K QAM. And now you see six could be something else. Yeah. So you have it's kind of counterintuitive because you you would normally think the higher the yeah. IUC, the faster the speed, but it's actually the opposite. So IUC thirteen might be the the lowest profile that you would have, or the lowest order modulation, maybe like sixty four qualm. That yeah. is the modulation that's used just to get the cable modem to come online. And then as the IUCs go lower in number so like iuc 11 would have a higher order modulation than 13 iuc 10 would have a higher order module so iuc 11 might be like 256 qualm and then iuc 10 might be like 1024 qualm so the the lower the number the faster the speed that you're going to achieve on that ofdma channel and then in that channel you can have override zones too you asked me about that one time right override zones where you know, like there might be shortwave radio in some of the spectrum. You say, let's exclude it. Or for, you know, no matter what IUC you're using in that spectrum, I'm going to make it 16 qualm. Right. So that way, because I know shortwave's getting in regardless. Uh, and once it gets in, because of noise funneling, it's affecting everybody anyway. 
You know, everyone is going back to that noise following point of the CMTS. Um, but having too many, it's not like it's a CPU burden. I mean, it's, uh, I believe a lot of it's in hardware. Uh, you, like I said, you have limited IUCs anyway. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm wondering if he's thinking of uh, IEs um, where if there are more, is it creating more downstream map traffic? Like my downstream map, is it bigger because of more information on the upstream? I don't think it is. So I, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think it's a problem. Yep. All right. Moving on to our next question. This one comes from Dakota M. He says, in my network, we're experiencing intermittent packet loss, and I suspect it's related to Doxus 3.1 profile management, something we've been talking about. How can we troubleshoot and resolve these issues? So I find this one I I find this one very interesting because we've been talking about how profile management can optimize the performance of modems in the network but um Dakota is indicating that he thinks that perhaps profile management you know changing profiles could be causing some intermittent packet loss. My initial thought on this is when the Doxus 31 modem is locked onto channels. It's locked to both SCQAM and OFDM channels. Um, this could also be in the upstream. He didn't specify what his packet loss was in the upstream or downstream. Um, in the upstream, it's locked to SCQAM and OFDMA channels. Uh, so, you know, is the packet loss coming from the SCQAM or is it coming from the OFDM or OFDMA channels? That's um, something that we need to know. And then also, like I would, I would want to ask Dakota: Did they try disabling um, the profile management application? Uh, you know, that's, this could be in the CMTS, where the CMTS is actually controlling the profiles dynamically, or it could be an external profile management application. Did they deactivate that and see if uh, the this intermittent uh, packet loss goes away? Because uh, obviously, they, something's yeah, changing there. Or maybe they're too aggressive, right? They're they're trying to react on something pretty quickly, and then they're going back to a modulation that maybe they should have held off. Like, you know what? We're dropping modulation. We're going to hold there for two hours. Yes. Oh yeah, it, it, it's fine. But you're at lower speed. But maybe the problems are it's actual noise problems, and the PMA is actually saving you. You know, it's dropping the modulation and it's getting better again. Yes. And then the PMA is getting too aggressive to go back really fast modulation. But it's an intermittent problem. So, so I love that thought. Um, I, I think you may actually may have nailed it because I, that should have occurred to me before that um, they may be using a PMA algorithm that's too aggressive. So there's there's two ways that you can approach PMA profile management application. You can say you know we 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 want to squeeze as much possible bandwidth as we can out of the OFDM or OFDMA channel. But in squeezing that bandwidth out you're going to cause modems to possibly drop the OFDMA or OFDM channel, or you're going to get more uncorrectable code word errors off there because, again, we're, we're, we're just trying to get as much bandwidth out. We're not caring about robustness. We're caring about bandwidth. The other way to move the lever is to say, you know, we're not as concerned about bandwidth. We're, we're more concerned about getting our DOCSIS 3.1 modems to lock onto our OFDM or OFDMA channels and stay locked to the O and this gets more onto the robustness, you know, stay on to those OFDMA and OFDM channels and actually utilize them. And and that kind of moves the lever the other way and say we, we don't want to get uncorrectable code words when they're actually using the OFDMA and, and OFDM channels. So you can kind of go one way or the other with that lever and that changes the algorithm that's used in PMA into basically, you know, what MER levels, what RX MER levels are used to set each profile when they're programmed into the CMTS. I think you may have nailed that one, John. In, in me, in one it's like, this is philosophical. <laughs> no one knew if this I was a channel on philosophy. Yeah, if I could run 1024 qualm, at what percent of uncorrectable FEC would be acceptable versus running, say, 64 qualm? 
because you're going to get much less throughput with 64. You might say, yeah. I'll run it 1024 calm. Even if I had 10% that had to retransmit, who cares? I'm still getting a lot more throughput than if I dropped everything to 64 calm. Well, the guy that's gaming cares. To, the guy that's sending an email to, doesn't care. It, yes, exactly. It comes down layer four and above the OSI model. Yeah. Does it have self-protection? Is it TCP based or UDP based? If it's UDP based, like voice calls, you're going to hear it. <laughs> you're going to notice it, it bad. Email, it's just going to resend the packets and I don't see nothing on, on my end, right. right? I don't see it. So if it's resending, if the application resends, no big deal. I'm still getting good speed. I'm dropping some packets. Big deal. It resends. But if it's a real-time protocol, real-time voice traffic, and you have dropped packets, you're going to quality is going to suffer. <laughs> and you're going to and, and maybe one. see this intermittent packet loss that Dakota is talking yes. about. Uh, so Victor Basaka says, and Victor, I apologize if I butchered your last name, but it's too late. I already did it. Is it possible to have upstream and downstream allocations to clients being equal, i.e. a client can get 10 megabits per second up and 10 megabits per second down? Sure. So, it's just symmetrical speed, right? Absolutely. We're trying, to, we're trying to get to one gig, which seems to be like my panacea or holy grail for a while. Yeah. One gig up and down. Uh, down is easy, up is difficult. And one yes. gig up is difficult. Um, it's definitely possible in a 204 megahertz system. We've done those numbers before with OFDMA, DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, we think we can easily get 1.5 gig of aggregate speed. So offering a one gig service is doable. Um, but anything lower than that in spectrum, then I don't think you're going to offer a one gig upstream. And really, DOCSIS 4.0. Yeah, really, DOCSIS 4.0 or 4.0 is really getting us that much closer to having oh, yeah. symmetrical speed yeah. in both ways, whether yeah. you're looking at full duplex DOCSIS or extended spectrum DOCSIS, because now we're we're really, uh, you know, extended spectrum DOCSIS, we're enabling operators to move their diplex filter all the way up to 600 and some megahertz. So you can have a very symmetrical upstream and downstream and that enables us to give very, very symmetrical speeds to- It used to be the to be rule of thumb was uh, we would offer a 10 by one ratio downstream to upstream. So if you offered uh, 100 meg down, it would be 10 meg up. And that was, everyone's happy with that. And then people were like, well, we want to start going symmetrical. Or the 10 to one actually got us in some trouble when we first got to DOCSIS uh, 3.1, where we had the downstream spectrum to offer higher speeds. We said, oh, one gig down. That's my no penalty problem. downstream, one gig. <laughs> and even the promotion, oh, I can offer one gig. No one ever said, well, how much can you offer in upstream? Because yeah. those customers weren't savvy enough to even ask about it. But I always was. I'm like, hey, what's upstream? Ah, oh, the sales guy didn't even know what to say. <laughs> Five um, megabits per I'm second. Like, right, I'm worried about my upstream. <laughs> I got cameras at home. I want remote access to the cameras, all this other stuff. And um, the 10 to 1 ratio was easy math. But it made it difficult because one gig down would require 100 meg up. And that became the problem. <laughs> in a four single qualm, four single carrier qualm, 42 megahertz spectrum, that's only 108 aggregate. So to yep. offer me 100 meg was tough. And then we said, you know what? A 20 by one ratio is still doable. And the reason why is it's still enough speed, 50 meg up is pretty darn good. But how much upstream do I need to support my downstream TCP flows? Because downstream over the top video is TCP based, adaptive bit rate. It requires upstream acknowledgements, which eats up my upstream. And if we did worst case scenario, that one gig down before act suppression came in, into the role, uh, it could have been 20 meg of upstream traffic just in acts yes. acknowledgement. Yes, it's so, completely upstream. So offering 50 meg, 20 meg just for downstream support gives me 30 meg still, so it's still fine. And offering 50 meg from a 108 aggregate pipe was was good. So, all right, we got some questions coming in. Um, Matthias is saying there is risk. There's a risk to mistake the packet loss happening due to noise seconds before the following modulation profile change with packet loss due to the profile change if you don't pay close attention. So, excellent point, Matthias. Um, so a, a modem could be on, let's say, 1024 QAM on an OFDMA channel, and that will start to take packet loss because of some impairment that comes in, and then the, the CMTS is going to uh, send a notification to modem and say, hey, you're taking noise, please drop to the next lowest modulation. And that's going to happen pretty quickly, so it's going to drop, say, to 512 
512 qualm, where it's no longer going to take those uncorrectable errors or that packet loss. So, um, and then that's going to be noticeable to your monitoring system. So really, really good point, Matthias. Um, good, good. Uh, and, and let's add in there another one that you and I have seen, the modem with bad pre-equalization. Remember there was yes. some firmware that was out where the modems didn't like the They get stuck. They get an equalizer setting that is um, compensating for an impairment that doesn't really exist and it yeah. takes errors. You could see the actual spectrum analyzer and the levels were like all over the place. Yes. And it was causing laser clipping too. Yep. So um, good point on that. Uh, bandit, high split. Yes. We move to the high split. We get more capacity. So good, good point on that. Uh, Jeremiah, how many mini slots need to fail MER or RX MER before modems change to a higher IUC? Are there other metrics like uh, uncorrectable FEC that trigger this? So, yes. John, I think we said that's typically ten percent, but I um, uh, before it fails. Yeah, but there, there's also in the CMTS there are FEC settings that define yeah. you know, once we reach a certain FEC level uh, that the modem will change that profile. Yeah, the, the original very stable rudimentary measurement was receive MER, like you mentioned, yeah. uh, the upstream MER. He said if the MER drops, the CMTS knows the table, knows the modulation, says, here's my current MER. Well, I'm not going to drop from IUC 11 all the way down to IUC 13 at 64 qualm, because according to the MER reading I got, you could do IUC 12 at 512 qualm. Right. Right. So the CMTS knows what makes sense. And it's not just a... I look at IUC number, it looks at the modulation under that IUC to say which one is legitimate, which one will work for the MER readings I'm seeing for that person. So it that's that's the rudimentary part, MER, no problem. But what if it's impulse noise, uncorrectable effect, where MER is perfect? Yes, it's MER just is impacting a little bit. <laughs> and, and yes, we can get MER for every subcarrier, but we don't trigger IUC change unless it's the MER in the mini slot. So it's like an average MER across that mini slot. So, because you don't want to trigger on a 25 kilohertz subcarrier that happens to have a low MER, right? Yeah. So it's like, we look at the whole mini slot. The question was about how many mini slots, it's actually per mini slot. So if the, if the one 400 kilohertz mini slot shows a low MER past the threshold that I have set, it's gonna change IUC. Right. Now, but if the MER is good, and as a fail safe, if uncorrectable fact hits a certain percentage over a certain amount of time, right. then I'm going to change. Right. And that, um, that, that captures the impulse noise because you could have a high RXMER, but you could have very rapid events occurring that RXMER doesn't capture, but uncorrectable fact will capture. And then the next catch all would be if all, like everything hits the fan, <laughs> we know it hits the fan, <laughs> so MER is bad, uncorrectable fact, and it's really bad or I'm not getting any response. The CMTS could go into partial mode. Right. Because you're cross bonding of DMA with single carrier qualm, you might say, you know what? I'm not having much success. And because the 3 1 modem prefers a 3 1 spectrum and nothing's going through, let's just shut him down. It doesn't really shut him down. The CMTS schedules the traffic. CMTS is like, just don't schedule any upstream mini slots on the OFDMA and force all those upstream traffic under the single carrier qualm. Yep. Our old faithful SC farm channels. Yeah, it's still not a good scenario either, but at least you know he's still getting traffic. So, user redacted, welcome back. We've, we know that name. Uh, he said, good afternoon, chat. And then he quickly, user redacted, redacted his own message. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're moving on to our last question here, number five. Uh, how do I manage higher input levels to a, an RMD, or a remote Mac Fi device? Uh, Rob asks, my vendor is telling me that I need SC, QAM, CMTS, receive levels at the input of the RMD uh, of plus 17 dBmV and OFDMA levels at the input of the RMD of plus 11 dBmV. I get that my RMD is in the field, but do these, do these levels sound right? And why is the OFDMA level so low? So the SC qualms plus 17 dBmV and the OFDMA plus 11, which are 60 be lower think, than the SC qualms. Isn't it ironic that it's 60 B and 60 B is the correction factor 
for the reporting of 1.6 versus 6.4. I think it's the same exact level. But it's I think just how the they're reading it. How it's being reported. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yep. I'm yep. saying 11 really is 17. That 11, if you were to look at a 1.6 megahertz sliver of the LFDMA, 11, the same. if you add up four of those to make 6.4, which is a single carat qualm, it would be 17. Now, good I observation, that, John. That, I actually, I didn't catch that when I was thinking about the question. Because the only other way to do what they're asking would be going to CMTS and set a different level for the cable modems. Right. You know, like it would be going to the CMTS and say, I want zero for single carrier qualm and I want negative six for the OFDMA. Yep. That would be crazy because now you're getting worse MER and OFDMA where you want to get better OFDMA. It's like I would have switched it the other way. I would have said, I want my OFDMA to hit a 17 my single carrier qualm to hit 11, you know, if I really wanted to get better performance. Yes. But I think what they're saying is it's the difference in reference level. Sure. So that's that's a great observation. And that makes sense why our, you know, our OFDM and SC qualms are probably actually at the same level, just how we're measuring. Now, now from the plant guy perspective, the outside plant guy who's, you know, replacing an analog node with an RMD, um, the, you know, remote Mac fight, Mac Phi device, are they going to have to rebalance the plant, or is this just padding at the fiber node, and, and are the cable yeah. modem levels going to have to change from your perspective? All things being equal, if you change an analog node to an RPD, RMD, um, because the CMT upstream chip is now in the node, and typically you want to hit there at zero, before you want to hit an upstream laser at like plus 10. Yep. So at the port, it was plus 17 because all the losses to the diplex voter and the splitters to hit the upstream laser was plus 10. It was 7 dB a loss, so hit the port at 17. That's where we came up with those numbers. And then when we looked at the taps and all that, that dictated what the modems needed to transmit to hit the upstream laser at plus 10. Now we're saying, hey, we only need zero at the upstream chipset where the laser used to be, and there's only a couple dB a loss from the chipset to the port. Uh, if I want the modems to still transmit the same level they did before, I'm going to have to put in maybe 8 dB a loss or 7 dB a loss. So some people are just putting a reverse input pad and saying, all right, I'll put the reverse input pad. Everything will still be equal. And then when I up, update my upstream spectrum where I'm worried about upstream levels because now I have to derate my levels because more spectrum, I take the pad out. Yes. So there, there's, there's cases where I've seen that occur where they – Remove an analog node, put a digital node in there, and put an upstream pad in there as part of their protocol um, and their up, up, I, upgrade protocol. But that so, would be a, de a design decision. That should be a design decision, right. right? Yeah. And now we have a remote Mac 5 device in, in the plant. We're seeing actually uh, uh, quite a few of these being installed and in getting rolled out. So we got RPDs out there, we have RMDs, and we have our analog plants out there. So lots of exciting so here, things here, going on here's one that a lot of people probably haven't seen but it's in the three one spec probably the, the, the multi spec or one of the our, our or the five spec um it says it has a table of modulation profiles and when you get the 2k and 4k qualm it says something about hitting the cmts at plus 10. i'm like why would this spec dictate to the cmts vendors what they can do <laughs> you know what they and, and I've noticed when we did it, we still kept the CMTS at zero and it still worked fine. So the spec was kind of basically saying the chipset itself might not have enough sensitivity at zero to get a good reading of 4K qualm on the upstream. I was going to say, this must be the upstream referring to 4K qualm. Oh, yes, it was upstream. Yeah. And you don't see anyone doing 4K qualm because there's no I just I, I just ran qualm. into an operator saying 4K qualm in the upstream. Oh, really? Nice. Yes. So nice. CMTS supports it. That's because if people don't know, CMTS is in the docs of spec is a should support, not a must. While as a cable yep. modem, cable modems must support 4K QAM in the upstream. So this cable operator has a CMTS that supports 4K QAM. And of course, their modems must support it. So they are they are running 4K QAM in a, in a portion of their plant in the upstream successfully. Peter right, Vittman, so welcome. Uh, he says, in the past, the receive level and the upstream are handled for ATDMA with absolute power based on the bandwidth eg 6.4 or 3.26 megahertz but ofdma is always at 1.6 megahertz well i mean that one let, let's let's quantify that 
Uh, the reporting power from the modem transmit side is based on 1.6. That's the reporting power. And from Cisco, from what I know, because I worked at Cisco, uh, the CMTS and cable modem, and I believe it's in the spec, it negotiates the level as if it were 6.4. Right. So if I have a modem that needs 53 dBmV for a single carry qualm, it's going to be the same for the OFDMA of 53 dBmV, which means to me that if I looked at a spectrum analyzer, regardless of the OFDMA width, bandwidth, it should look the same level as a 6.4 on a spectrum analyzer. Correct. Should look flat. So, and that comes down to uh, power per hertz versus average power versus channel channel power. Uh, and it could be dictated by the CMTS vendor. Yes. There is some wiggle room there on the CMTS vendor. Good. Well, Peter, thank you. And Peter also says, uh, newer implementations use a unique level based on 1.6 megahertz, no matter if it's ATDMA with a 6.4 megahertz bandwidth or OFDMA, uh, it's much easier to handle. I am curious, Peter, does that also apply to 3.2 megahertz? I would assume by what you're saying, that's going to apply to 3.2 megahertz as well, that they'll also be referenced to 1.6. I, I think what he's, what he's getting at is the problem where uh, you have a 3.1 CMTS and you have a 3.1 modem, you didn't activate any OFDMA, and you're still doing single carry qualm, according to the spec, that modem still has to report based on 1.6. So you could take out a 3.0 modem from the customer's house. It says mm -hmm. it says 49 dBmV transmit. You put in a 3.1 modem, and all of a sudden, that 6.4 channel is saying 6 dB lower right. transmit because it's reporting based on 1.6. But that's the spec for that modem and CMTS that says, Regardless if you're transmitting no OFDMA or single carrier qualm, the 3 0 modem has to transmit, report its transmit power based on 1.6. So there's a, an apples to apples uh, comparison. But for a, does a 3. Point, the 3.1 modem, when it's transmitting a 3.2 megahertz carrier, uh, is it going to report that in a 1.6 megahertz uh, bandwidth? Yes. yes. So everything then is on the same plane. So the correction factor there would be 3 dB. And, and so, Peter just confirmed that. Thank, yeah. thank you, Peter. He confirmed that. He says, yes, this will also cover the 3.2 megahertz ATDMA as well. Thank you. So what Cisco did is we came up with, we have a command that was showed show Kim modem phi that showed modem transmit levels. And we said, hey, let's do a show Kim modem phi norm for normalized. And it would report the power level based on the channel width again. Yeah. So that way I knew like how much power, I didn't have to do the math in my head. <laughs> it's all the I automatic. The power was with Sinclair Quan for the whole channel. Yeah. Well, Peter's saying the report on the CM is still different. Uh, that may be a different CMTS <laughs> vendor. <laughs> I think I think I have an idea of who, what CMTS vendor Peter may be referring to, but I'm, I'll, I'll keep my speculations to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much, Peter. That was good information. Thanks, John, for explaining that. Um, I think we've reached, uh, we're at time. We're right coming right up on the top of the hour, John. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. So, we John, questions, right? yeah, we, we covered our questions. We got, thanks so much for all the great questions in the chat. Thanks, Peter. Peter's saying the SNMP reports from ATDMA is still 6 dB higher for 6.4. So yeah, so SNMP, our lovely, wonderful SNMP from back in the 1980s is still trying to catch up with us. <laughs> Someday it'll get there, guys. So, folks, that's a wrap for our deep dive into DOCSIS 3.1. Thanks, John, for your insights. Thank you for our audience for the great chat today. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more of these tech discussions. We appreciate your input. We'll be back on February 9th for our next installment of our Back to Basics series uh, with Ron Rannick. He says he has something really exciting up his sleeve for us. So be sure not to miss that episode. Until then, everyone, take care. And username redacted says Brady and John. Thanks for everything. Username redacted. Thank you for joining. Thanks everyone for joining. Till next time. Take care, everyone, and so long. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>